I'm not a doctor. I was supposed to be, but here we are. Hello my shiny face, hello my besties. It is currently about to thunderstorm outside. So if the lighting is a little bit como se dice not here, that's why. But you know, I feel like you can kind of see me. Like, can you see me? I feel like you can. We're gonna hope for the best, but expect the worst because you know, it's me. Anyway, first things first, crack open a cold one. You know, I feel like you guys may think that I can't survive without caffeine because I just noticed in every single video, vi vi hmm, words, every single video, I either have a coffee, a Red Bull, a Celsius, like some sort of energizing thing. And I, I promise I'm okay. Maybe, maybe I'm not, you know, but we're working on it. <laughs> first things first, my shirt. What do we think? What do we think? Oh my goodness me. Ready? It has, are you seeing this? It has, it has all of the, are you seeing? Uh, you can't really see. Oh no. Look at the back, the wingspan. We love. Okay. Anyway, completely besides the point. I'm currently reading Agatar. The vlog is coming next week. Part one and two. It's going to be a full spoiler reading vlog of Agatar. Two parts. So incredibly long. I'm so excited for you guys to see it. Wow. I just can't even breathe. Comment if you're excited to see it. Okay, so anyway, what we're doing today is something super fun, super fresh, super exciting. I have some tropes that I hate, okay? As I'm sure you do too. We're all romance readers over here. We have some tropes that we're just not fans of, right? But then you know that one book or those two books, whatever, that you read it either not knowing that it had said trope or you knew but you liked the author so you wanted to go into it anyway. And then it changed your mind about the trope. Like just that one book, even though you hate that trope, the book did it for you, you know? That's kind of what we're gonna be talking about today. And by kind of, I mean we all. I don't know why I said kind of. I have several tropes over here that I absolutely hate, but then book recs for said trope that completely changed my mind on it. So how exciting. A little bit of difference today. You know what I mean? Talking about things that we hate. Usually we talk about things that we love. Well, technically we're still talking about things that we love because it's books that we love within that trope. Hmm. You get the point. Oh my God. Somebody commented that I look like I have horns because of the two paintings and now I can't unsee it. Like I keep looking over there because it just looks like I have horns. If you see me looking over there, that's why. Okay, first things first, accidental pregnancy. We hate it, we hate it. Pregnancy, bleh. well, <laughs> fictional pregnancy. Real pregnancy, oh, I love that for you. You have that child. I love babies. Not for me, but for you. I'm so happy for you, okay? But in books, when you have a relationship either going well, or they just met, or it's a one night stand, what have you, and then all of a sudden, the next morning, girly wakes up and she's sick. She wakes up and she's like, I feel like I'm, throw I'm gonna throw up. Immediately I know what's going on. Immediately I know you're pregnant. You have to be pregnant. Of course, right? Because what else could you possibly be doing? You're pregnant. You don't have food poisoning. You're pregnant and I hate it, okay? So if a book has accidental pregnancy, I'm usually not a fan. I think that I'm not a fan because it kind of usually forces the couple to be together even though like they maybe wouldn't have been because of the child and I just see like that not working out in the long run which is why I hate it okay but there are two books that I read last year that both have accidental pregnancy in it and both fucking amazed me I absolutely devoured it so if you're gonna read accidental pregnancy it has to be one of these two okay first we've got out on a limb by Hannah Bone and Young this book follows when and Bo and I am pretty sure it's dual POV and basically they meet on Halloween one night at a party and they have a one night stand and you guessed it next morning oh I'm sick well not the next morning probably like a month later how does pregnancy work I'm not really sure I'm not a doctor I was supposed to be but here we are anyway she gets pregnant from this man who she had a one night stand with so they agree like let's co-parent let's do this you know we're gonna be friends nothing nothing between us we're just friends but we're gonna raise this baby together this book felt like a breath of fresh air like air was fresh in my breath <laughs> like picture me yeah fresh air it just felt so cozy and comfy it felt like a warm hug I don't like know if Hannah Bone and Young's other books are like this but maybe it's the way she writes that just feels different than other books it felt mature the characters felt like they just knew how to communicate and knew how to navigate this pregnancy and it didn't feel like they were together because of the pregnancy it felt like it was a blessing for them you know which I really really enjoyed this book is so fucking cute I highly recommend especially if you're in a reading club I feel like this is the perfect book for that then we have Reckless by Elsie Sover this is part of the Chestnut Spring series but you can read them all as standalones this follows Theo and Winter and it is dual POV, another one night stand kind of book. So T is like a bull rider, adventurous, wild, and she is very to herself. It's like reverse grumpy sunshine. He is the sunshine and she's the grump, which is amazing to see. I loved, loved, loved her character. It was very different than the other female characters I've read about before and I loved her. Anyway, they have a one night stand and then <laughs> a child. A child. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, the child is born. So they have to, again, co-parent said child. This one has a little bit of miscommunication, which I didn't love. I'm gonna be honest. That's why this book wasn't a five star for me. It was only because of the miscommunication, but their relationship is amazing. The way Theo understands her, the way Winter is, them raising this baby, like all of it was so wholesome and cute and also save a horse, ride a bull rider. No, wait. <laughs> Save a horse, ride a cowboy, save a bull, ride a bull, ride. save a bull, ride a bull rider. Yeehaw, you know? Okay, Reckless by Elsie Silver. Highly fucking recommend. Another trope that I try my hardest to stay away from. This isn't a trope that I like, it, it, I hate it with all my being. Most people do. This is a very popular hated book, okay? Not book, trope. But I don't absolutely, you know, despise it. The cheating trope. Yes, the cheating trope. Okay, there are two books that immediately come off the top of my mind, head, yeah, it's in my brain, that have the cheating trope. And this isn't a spoiler, everybody pretty much knows that these books have cheating tropes. First of all is Bound by Honor by Cora Riley. This is a series, it's the, the Bound by and then the Kimura Chronicles, like entire Cora Riley universe. I did a whole vlog about it if you want to see it. And basically it follows Luca and Arya and it, is her name Arya? Yeah, her name's Arya. Rhea? Arya. Ara. Her name's Arya. Yeah, sure. It's only from her POV. And it's a marriage of convenience mafia, okay? So basically, these two families, they're rival mafias, and then they marry to, like, make the mafia be together. You know, marriage of convenience. So the cheating trope in this, it's very vivid, I will say. I hated it. Like, when I read this book, it made me want to die. But I continued the series, and I fell for the couple afterwards. So... If I were you, I would go into the entire thing. If you're gonna only read this one, you're probably not gonna love the couple. I'm not gonna lie, because that's what happened to me. I definitely hated what happened, but also it's a marriage of convenience, so the, the cheating trope is like sort of forgivable, even though I was super fucking angry. Throughout the other books, it sort of explains it a little bit more, and the couple redeems themselves, in my personal opinion. Bound by Honor, Carly, Search of Trigger Warnings, it's a dark romance. And second, we have one of my favorite books of all time. You guys know what I'm gonna say, Magnolia Parks by Jessa Hastings. This is also a series you have to read them in order. It like it's two universes, Magnolia Parks and then Daisy Hates. You can read Magnolia Parks by itself and Daisy Hates by itself if you'd like, but you can't like scatter it all around or else you're not going to understand. So Magnolia Parks, one, two, and the third one's coming out soon, which is the last one, follows Magnolia and BJ and it's dope POV. And they are basically childhood best friends to lovers, to enemies, to strangers, to lovers. It's a mess. It's basically if Gossip Girl was a book, it would be this. Gossip Girl is a book, isn't it? I haven't read it. <laughs> If Gossip Girl was a book that's not the actual Gossip Girl, it would be this, okay? Picture Chuck and Blair, but in bookish form and make it in the UK. Is it London? You know I love a London boy. Are they London? I don't really know where they are now that I think about it. High Society London, I'm pretty sure. And they're all like super rich and super fancy and just basically the lifestyle that we can never attain but we love to read about. That's them. So much drama. There is the cheating trope. In the first book, you're gonna hate it, but in the second book, you're gonna understand it. So I say stick to it. It's one of my favorite series. I rated every single book five stars. So if there's one book with the cheating trope that I would recommend, it would be this one. Just try it. Try it. Don't knock it till you try it. A little Red Bull break, you know? Not sponsored, but I wish it was. Could you imagine one day if Red Bull sponsors me? Like, I would just die. I would just pass out. Like, you would not hear from me again because I'd be dead. Another trope that I absolutely despise with every fiber of my being is insta-love, which means when they immediately fall in love, okay? I saw someone once say that they thought insta-love was like Instagram love, which is hilarious to me because that's so like, that's so true. Why do they call it insta-love? Well, insta, like, instantly. I think that's where it comes from. Never mind then. Ignore my question. I already answered it. You don't need to answer it. I came with the conclusion on my own. I am so smart. Anyway, insta-love. When they fall in love immediately or insta-lust, they immediately have sex, whatever. I don't usually love those books. I'm a slow burn person through and through. Like, Marianne Zapata is my favorite author. I clearly love slow burns, okay? But these two books have insta-love, sort of, insta-lust, insta-attraction, and I absolutely ate them up. They're a part of the same series, but you can read them as standalones if you'd like. It's The Pucking Wrong Number and The Pucking Wrong Guy, both by C.R. Jane. Pucking Wrong Number follows Lincoln and Monroe, and basically he texts someone thinking that it's someone, and it's not that someone, it's someone else. <laughs> He texts the number and it ends up being Monroe and he becomes absolutely obsessed with her. And then the fucking wrong guy is Ari and Lila and they are childhood friends to strangers, to lovers. He literally sees her again and he's like, I must have you. Both of them are extremely unhinged. Both of them are like stalker behavior. Both are very dark and they're both hockey romances. Do with all that information what you will. They're very insta-lovey, but they were very, very fun. Especially Ari, he's a Taylor Swift stan. Immediately, I love him. Next is a trope that just, it just irks me. I don't hate it, but I'm gonna go ahead and say that I 
dislike it. It just gets under my skin. My skin's here, it's underneath it. It is the say it with me now miscommunication trope when they don't know how to fucking speak to each other and they either don't talk for years because of it or they have a fight because of it they break up because of it what have you i usually hate that trope but these two books they do it very well okay first up we've got the og one of my favorites love in other words by christina lauren this follows elliot and macy i'm pretty sure it's only told from macy's pov and it follows a then now timeline so you see the past of them and you see the present they are childhood friends to lovers to strangers to lovers again they don't talk for many many years because of something that happened between them and then they see each other again at a coffee shop and start to kind of rekindle things so this is the perfect like summer cozy read but it does have miscommunication because if they would have just fucking talked that would have never happened but it's fine it's fine it was still a five star i love it now another book that is pretty much the same as this one like it feels like this author i i don't know what she did okay i don't want to speak for her but it feels like she literally read love in other words and then she was like i'm gonna make the exact same thing because it's ever summer after by carly fortune it is basically the same. A couple things are changed, but if you like Love In Other Words, you'll probably like Every Summer After. It feels like Love In Other Words plus like The Summer I Turned Pretty and that's Every Summer After. It's like if they had a child. It follows, I want to say her name is Percy, but I may be thinking about Percy Jackson. Is her name Percy? I feel like her name is Percy and his name's Sam, but don't quote me on that. It's also only told from her POV. Also then and now. <laughs> also childhood friends to lovers to strangers to lovers she comes back into town after many years of not speaking to him and um they obviously run into each other because it's a small town and again they rekindle things miscommunication out the wazoo the wazoo miscommunication is coming out of it but it's really good really fun summer cozy read it wasn't a five star for me like love in other words was because something in the end really pisses me off but it was really good now i have unrequited love unrequired unrequited i think it's unrequited basically when she loves him and he doesn't love her back for a while that's kind of where i'm going with this usually i don't mind that kind of love if it's him for her like if he's obsessed with her and she doesn't care yet that's fine but if she's obsessed with him and he he doesn't care i hate it okay and that's the case with this book but oh my god this book is good and when i show you this book you're gonna be like larry you said you were never gonna read this author again and you were so damn right you were so damn right but let's remember that i'm a liar because i read it and i ate it up it's sable peak by devony perry does devony perry only write white people in montana absolutely are all the books pretty much the same absolutely but i took a long break from reading her and then when i read sable peak i feel like it just did it for me like it just I hate it up. What can I say? Okay, he follows Mateo and Vera. It's still a POV. He is a single dad and she is... She's a person. <laughs> what does she do? I don't really even know what she does. She shows up to like the Eden family after some things happen in her life and then she immediately has a crush on Mateo and he just does not does not see it. He does not see her at all. This man is basically the, the definition of I can't see I'm blind. <laughs> Light. Okay, and I did feel a little bit secondhand embarrassment a couple of moments in this book for her, but disregarding that, it was really, really good. It felt comforting. I loved the ending to the Edens, especially because I read the whole series, so why not like read this book, you know? I knew I was going to finish the Edens, even though I didn't want to read Devin Perry again. I knew I was going to finish that series just because I started it. Of course, I'm going to fucking finish it, you know? And it was the perfect ending, in my opinion. I think they were one of the best couples. They were very mature. The story was amazing. I loved the single dad aspect. It just was what I needed at the moment. I read it in a cabin in the woods, which I think made the whole aesthetic even better. Yes, highly recommend and say will peak. They're all interconnected standalone, so you can read whichever books you want from the Eden series. I would tell you to read Juniper Hill and Sable Peak. Those are my two personal favorites. The other ones, they're okay. This next one is a trope I claim to hate. I say I hate it. If you ask me about it, I'll be like, I hate that trope. But do I? Because I keep watching shows about it. I keep watching movies. I keep reading the books. So clearly there's something that calls me to this trope, okay? It's the classic love triangle, okay? We've got a little triangle. Basically, there's, there's a someone right there, and then there's two people right there and they are all intertwined, okay? It's drama, it's it's pining, it's one person always being upset, it's a winning team and a losing team. It's it's a lot, okay? But for some reason, I can't stay away because as soon as I read Twilight, I was like, hmm, interesting, do I hate this? Do I hate this? And then Vampire Diaries came, and then The Semi Turn Pretty came, and then what are some other love triangles? Baby Daddy, what else? 
the heart of Dixie. Like there are plenty of things that I love that have love triangles. So I don't really know if I hate this trope, but I'm gonna say I hate it because most of the time I don't look for it, okay? Number one with this trope. Number one book that I'm not gonna tell you anything about because I say you go in blindly, say you swear. Say You Swear by Megan Brandy is just the book for Love Triangle. It doesn't feel like you're reading Love Triangle. It just takes you for the most heartbreaking, beautiful, sad, amazing, fluffy, gorgeous, cute, sweet. The best journey of your life is Say You Swear by Megan Brandy. Just trust me, go into it blindly and you'll get it. You'll get it. Another one that is, of course, everybody knows this one. I'm gonna say it, but you already know The Summer I Turned Pretty by Jenny Han. <laughs> I'm Team Conrad. I'm Team Comet. If you're Team Jeremiah, you can be Team Jeremiah. You're just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this is a trilogy, okay? So you have to read all three books. It follows Belly, Conrad, Jeremiah. Conrad and Jeremiah are in fact brothers. That's also a theme in love triangles for some reason. It's usually brothers. I don't know why. But anyway, they go to a summer house together every summer and they, they live they live their best lives. This is YA, it's cute, it's fluffy, it's summer. It's like the perfect beach read. If you wanna go read it by the beach this summer, you do you. It's currently not summer at all. It's in fact, win is it winter? Is it winter? I think it might be winter, but you can read it whenever you want. Just go read it by the beach, you know? Do, do what I say. <laughs> <laughs> and B Team Conrad. And then we have two series by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. We have The Naturals by her and we have The Inheritance Games. I would definitely say The Inheritance Games is more popular, but my personal favorite is The Naturals. Both of them have a little love triangle in it, but both of them are subplots, okay? Like The Naturals is basically criminal minds, but with YA. Like it's these teens that get chosen because they have gifts. They get chosen to solve FBI cold cases. It is so fucking good. And there's like a case that goes throughout all the books and then a case in each book. It feels like you're watching a Criminal Mind episode, but then it, there's also romance in it. And it's a subplot and I love my team. I chose my team. I'm Team Dean. You can be whichever team you want, but Team Dean is the correct answer. <laughs> and then the Inheritance Games is Jameson and Grayson. Yeah, Jameson and Grayson, and the girl's name is Avery. And then basically this one is a lot of puzzles. Avery inherits a billionaire fortune from this man who she has no idea who he is, but he dies and gives her his entire fortune. But the one thing is she has to go live in his house with his grandsons, which are Jameson and Grayson. There's the love triangle. Guess what? They're brothers. Yep, there you have it. I'm team Jameson. You can be team Grayson, but I'm team Jameson. Okay, I said what I said. This one has a lot of puzzles and riddles. You try to figure out as you go, but you can't figure it out because you're stupid. That's at least what happened to me. You you might figure it out, but I didn't. Anyway, both of them, highly recommend. Both have love triangles, subplots. This trope is not one that I hate, but it is one I try to stay away from just because I don't really love like other people drama in books. It's runaway bride, okay? When a bride either runs away from her wedding or she's about to get married, what have you, but the love of her life is someone else. Oh, I usually hate those, okay? But Powerless by Elsie Silver, it did the damn thing, okay? Clearly Elsie Silver knows what she's doing because she'd be taking tropes I hate and making me like them. What the fuck? It follows Sloan and Jasper and they grew up together, they're best friends, and she's about to get married and then she needs to run away from her wedding. She's like, oh my God, I cannot do this. And he helps her run away. So good. I think he's a hockey player and I think she does ballet. He was a hockey player, she did ballet. What more can I say? I don't really know if that is the truth. So don't call me on it, I don't know. But I think that's right. I think that's the plot. Larry, 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 yeah. <laughs> I should just quit my day job and start like singing full time, start writing music because I clearly have a talent that cannot be held down. Another book that has this trope is A Long Time Coming by Megan Quinn. Oh my God, this is the best book in that series. I personally think so. Not So Me Cute is so fun, but A Long Time Coming, it's been a long time coming, but it follows Breaker and Leah and it's Joe POV and they are best, best, best friends. They've been best friends since college, but Leah is about to get married and she asks him to be her best man. Yeah, it reminds me of my best friend's wedding. It's like that kind of vibe. Oh my god, it's so good. I say a little prayer for you. If you haven't watched that movie, please do. My best friend's wedding is so fucking good. Anyway, it feels like that. If you like that movie, I feel like you'll love this book. The pining, the tension, the banter, the best friends. Like, it was so good. I think it's one of Megan Quinn's best books. Please read it. This trope I'm gonna tell you right now, I hate it with every fiber of my being. When I watched Smallville long ago, okay, I saw Lana Lang and I realized I hate this trope. It, she immediately became the bad bitch that she deserved to be, okay? But in the beginning, she was a damsel in distress and I hate that trope. 
<laughs> Damsel in distress, y'all. I'd like to see a woman be amazing because she deserves to be. She doesn't need a man to do shit for her, okay? But these next two books, <laughs> they're very damsel and distressy, but they're very good, okay? First up, we've got Hot House Flower by Kristen Becker Ritchie. This follows Daisy and Reich, and it's Dope POV. If you want to read the entire Dick to Calloway Sister series, I have a whole video on the order, so you can go watch that. I'm not going to talk too much about it now because you guys know this is my favorite series, but Reich and Daisy's books are only Hot House Flower and Long Way Down. In Long Way Down, I, I wouldn't say Daisy's a damsel in distress, but in Hot House Flower, it definitely does give that vibe, but I still ate it up. I still ate it up. Every time they like came to her rescue, I was like, oh, I was blushing. My feminism, it left. It completely left because Rike fucking Meadows. Yes. He likes to rock climb, but I like to Rike climb. Moving on. And another one is Things We Never Got Over by Lucy Score. Naomi and Knox, this one, and it's dual POV. She comes into town, literally in her wedding dress still. It also fits the runaway bride scenario, but she runs into town and he sees her and he's like, oh my god, this mess of a woman, she needs my help. So it is again, damsel in distress, but it's also a little bit of single mom. It's small town. It's funny. The characters do act like children, but disregard that. Completely ignore it and you'll have a good time. This is not really a trope. I don't, I don't know if it's a trope. It's, it's a genre type of books. It's why choose romances, which basically means that the person does not have to choose. They are with everyone. It's, it's a group, it's, it's a group thing. All of them together with each other. Okay. I don't look for it in books, but if I happen to read, it and it's good, then it's good, okay? That's what happened with me with Faking with Benefits by Lily Gold. Lily Gold only writes why chooses, but she writes rom-com why choose. So it's like funny and you really get to know the characters because they're long books, which I enjoy. It follows Zach, Luke, and I think the guy's name is Josh, and then her name is Lila. I think. Is that right? Let's double check. Um, <clears throat> what is your name, kind sir? Oh yeah, Josh. Okay, we've got Zach, Josh, and Luke. Zach is the huge rugby player. Josh is the boy next door, and Luke is the silver-haired divorcee. Okay, so they each like have a different personality, and then Lila is their their next door neighbor who who you know is with all of them. <laughs> This gave me new girl vibes because literally like the all the guys are roommates and they're all so different and then she joins the picture. It feels like if new girl was a white shoes, it would be faking with benefits by Lily Gold. And the next one, I feel like you guys are no way I'm gonna say, but it's the Losers Duet by Harley LaRue. So this one has Manson, Jason, Lucas, Vincent, and Jess, all five of them. It's the Losers duet, but the Dare is a prequel to it. So I would say read the Dare and then Losers Part 1, Losers Part 2. This is a white shoes also. It goes between a little bit of a then and now timeline. It shows you how they all, you know, met in high school and the fact that they hated each other because they were the losers and she was like the queen bee, the popular one. And now it's a couple years later and she needs her car fixed and she's like, hey, I don't have money. And they're like, it's fine, you could just have sex with us. <laughs> These books are very plot-based. No, that's so wrong. These books are very character-based. There's absolutely no plot. But for some reason, I fell for all the characters slowly. In the first book, I really wasn't that interested. But in the second one, they really won me over. If you're going to do a why choose, it should be done this way. This next one, I don't really think is a trope, if I'm going to be honest. But it's just kind of a description that's given in books that I personally despise. And that's the super tiny MC. Super, super tiny girl. And they keep talking about it over and over again. She is so small. I can hold her in my pocket. Oh my god. She is the size of a pretzel. She's like a little Polly Pocket that we could just take around everywhere. She is oh so tiny. I hate it. I hate it. Because why? Why must you be the way you are? She can be tiny and you not make it into a thing. You could say, hey, she, she's kind of short and she's super small. The end. The end. But why must you remind us over and over again? Why are you the way you are? I hate that. But one book that can do it. <laughs> you are the only exception. It's Binding 13 and Keeping 13 by Chloe Walsh. We know Shannon and Johnny, okay? Shannon and Johnny, duo POV. These books are everything to me. Inject them in my bloodstreams, but they do talk about the fact that Shannon is small over and over. But the reason for it is different than in other books, okay? Because these, these like, the children in these books, they deal with so fucking much in their family life that it makes sense why she's so small and why they talk about it so much. So that is why it is the exception for me with this trope. I hate it when people are like, they keep talking about how small Shannon is. Yeah, yeah, because she's not doing well, okay? Like clearly it shows you. So this is the exception for me. I hate that description, but in these books, it can be done, okay? Please read Boys of Tommen. Please search up your trigger warnings, but it is so fucking good. Teacher student. Teacher student. 
teacher student. Okay, when I watched Pretty Little Liar back in the day, liars, I was obsessed with Arya and Ezra. I was like, oh my god, this is amazing. Why don't her parents want this to happen? Because it was so illegal. She was like, what, 16 or 15 or something like that? And he was like 24, 27. I don't even know how fucking old he was, but it was a teacher student relationship. It was highly inappropriate, but little me was cheering for it, okay? I would like die for them back then. <laughs> Now I see that that was a little problematic, but there are some teacher-student books that I do quite enjoy. It's not a trope I look for. In fact, I try to stay away from it, but these, these books, I like them, okay? I like them. First up is Lessons in Sin by Pam Godwin. This is not only a teacher-student, but he is Father Magnus, as in a priest. <laughs> So everything forbidden, taboo, inappropriate is in this book. It is a little bit of a darker romance, but she is a, a student in his Catholic school, I'm pretty sure, where he is not only a priest, but also her teacher. There is the degradation trope in this, degradation, degradation. Like when he talks down upon her, like you, you little slut, like that. There is that trope in here, which I also hate, but I really enjoyed this book. I, I don't know what it was about it, but I just couldn't stop reading. Like, forgive me, Father, because I truly have sinned. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And another one that I really liked is not really a teacher-student, but it's more of a coach-player dynamic, and that is Colty by Mariana Zapata. I really just wanted to include a Mariana Zapata book in this video. I'm not gonna lie, because I absolutely love her, and I feel like you all need to read her books. Slow burn. Okay, slow. It follows Colty and Sal, and she is a football player, and he is her coach. So it is a little bit also forbidden and appropriate kind of thing, but they are so, like, like, of age. They're so such good friends. It's not done in an appropriate, creepy way. I would highly fucking recommend. Please read Colty by Mario Zapata. It's not really teacher student, but but let's pretend for the sake of this video, okay? It's a little bit coach, player, teacher, student, same thing. My camera's about to die. We must go through these next ones really fast. We only have three more tropes, okay? First up, step siblings. Step siblings. I usually hate it. But I watched Life with Derek and I really was cheering for Derek and Casey. So do I hate it? I'm not sure. Maybe there's something wrong with me. Okay, but they're step siblings. They're step. It's not like they're related. If they were related, of course I wouldn't. But they're step. They're not related. We draw the line there. We have standards for the fans by Nyla K. You knew I was going to recommend this, of course. Kai and Avi, okay? This is dual POV stepbrothers. They go to the same college and they are so, so different from each other. One of them is football team popular guy. The other one is the mascot, introvert, artistic one. They're so different. They hate each other. So it's enemies to lovers, stepbrothers, forbidden, MM, opposites attract. Yes, please fucking read for the fans, please. One of the spiciest books ever, but one of the deepest, best books I've ever read. Next, we've got sibling significant other, meaning it's either your sister's fiance or your sister's boyfriend, where it's your brother's fiance fiance, your brother's boyfriend, what have you. Usually I don't like that trope. Again, going back to my like other people involved in it kind of drama. Don't love it. But these three books, oh, absolutely ate it up. Still Beating by Jennifer Hartman, Kill Switch by Penelope Douglas, and Sweetest Oblivion by Danielle Laurie. All of them have like sisters, fiance, sisters, husband, sisters, boyfriend, what have you. But all of them were so good. Still Beating follows Cora and Dean, and Dean is Cora's sister's fiance, but they can't get kidnapped together. So they go through a lot and then, you know, things occur. What are you gonna do? They were kidnapped, okay? You can't blame them. Love made them crazy. If it doesn't, you ain't doing it, right? One of the best dark romances, Search of Trigger Warnings. Sweet as Oblivion is a mafia marriage of convenience, arranged marriage kind of thing. He is arranged to marry her sister, but then things happen. What are you gonna do? One of the best mafia books, in my personal opinion. It follows Nico and Elena and it's still POV. And lastly, Kill Switch by Penelope Douglas. This is part of the Devil's Night series. You can read it as a standalone if you'd like. Winter and Damon, also do a POV and he he is engaged to her sister so but you know what there's so many other things wrong with this book that you don't even really focus on that <laughs> it follows a then and now timeline they knew each other in high school and now it's a couple of years later last trope i absolutely hate despise want to die just thinking about it is going to have some spoilers if you don't want to hear spoilers for two books do not watch this part but it is the death trope aka one of them dies one of them dies, one of the main characters die. I try to stay away from it because I'm already so scared of people around me dying. I'm, I'm already so anxious about that that I just cannot have that in a book. I wanna escape that. These two books have it and I knew about one going into it. I didn't know about the other one. So one of them was on me, you know what I mean? The other one was on the author for doing this to me. A Thousand Boy Kisses by Tilly Cole. There's the death trope in this. It is one of the most beautiful books ever written. 
but there's the death trope. And then Exodus by Kate Stewart. It is part of the Ravenhood trilogy. And I was not fucking expecting one of them to die. What the fuck? That is all. That is all. I need to go because my camera is literally beeping at me that it's gonna die. The fact that it stayed alive for this long is beyond me. But thank you so much for watching this video. Let me know if there are other tropes that you don't like that you want to see me recommend books for because it's fine. You know, like you going into a book thinking you're not gonna like it, but then you fucking love it because the author just did such a good job. That's what happened with me with all of these books. Hope you enjoyed this recommendation. I love you. I love you. I love you. One last Red Bull sip for the road. Yeah, we did it. We did it. Go team. I love you.